Welcome to this video, which is going to be the first of four videos on gut embryology. Now, in terms of the development of the gut, it's quite a big system to go through. So I thought what I'll do is I'll break this particular um, body system into four parts. So there's going to be one on the full gut, one on the mid gut, one on the hind gut, and one on the mesenteries. Today, we're going to cover the full gut. Now, in terms of learning outcomes for today, what I want you to know. First of all, where does a full gut start? Where does it end anatomically? What are the, what's the blood supply of the foregut and what are the main diverticula of the foregut? So they're the main learning outcomes of the foregut that I want you to take home today. So now have a look at the board. The first three images that I want you to look at are these top ones. Now starting in black, the black is what essentially is the surface ectoderm. So this is the top layer of the trilaminar disc and so that's the the outer part of the embryo at this point. This is a mid-sagittal cut, so we've cut the embryo straight down the middle and we're looking inwards. This is more of an external view, which you can just see the insides of, and this is a complete cross-section. So I've cut the embryo in that plane and I'm looking into it. So that's to get your bearings. In terms of colors, we've got black, which is the surface ectoderm, the outer part. The blue in this case is going to be the neural tube, which you can see here, and that's going to be the developing central nervous system. That would be kind of amongst the black color in this image. Orange is going to be the endoderm, and in this case, the endoderm is what creates most of the gut tube. Okay, so if you think of, it, if you think of the tube itself, like a hollow tube starting from the mouth, all the way to the cloaca, which you can see sitting like this. This group or this tube of group of cells is, has come from, has arisen from the endoderm. And so that's essentially what it is. So every, all the epithelial cells in your GIT comes from the endothelial cells. All the parenchymal, so the functional cells of the accessory organs, like the liver, like the pancreas, comes from the endoderm. All the connective tissue parts of the gut and the muscles and so forth will come from mesoderm. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the gut tube starts at the mouth, ends at the cloaca, and I've drawn that in orange. So all this structure, which I'll go through in a second, is essentially going to be from an endodermal origin, and that's the tube there sitting like so. All the red is going to be essentially mesoderm, Okay, so we've got gut tube, sorry, you've got neurotube there, notochord there, sitting in front of that is the aorta, and that's going to be coming down the back here. So I'll point out why that's important in a minute. That's the tube, that's the aorta there, which is this one here. It's going to be important in terms of the blood supply to the gut tube. On either side of the aorta is the lateral plate. This is important, particularly for the, mesen sorry, the mesentery uh, lecture. But it basically breaks into two plates. We have a somatic okay, plate or parietal plate, which goes on the outside of the body wall. And we've got a splanchnic or a visceral plate, which kind of goes intimately into the organs. And so what that leaves is a space, and that's called the coelom, which is essentially going to be a big hollow space in the developing embryo for things to form into. I'll explain why this becomes important a bit later, particularly for the lungs and the developing gut. But at this point, just know that there's the visceral splanchnic or the parietal somatic um, two plates with an empty um, space in the middle. Now, in terms of how does the gut tube first form, we've said it starts with the endoderm. But if you look here, what we've done here is at about four weeks, the embryo at the head end, so the head end, tail end, folds in on itself. So this is cranial caudal folding. So it folds in. And what that has done is caused the endoderm here and here to become blind pouched. So it's blinded here, blinded here. Whereas the rest of it, it has actually come out of the embryo, which you can see it's sticking out like this. And this is what we call the yolk sac. And this is the mid gut. So the foregut is inside, 
hind guts inside and the mid gut is within essentially the yolk stack. So it's coming out of the embryo. It's connected to the outer with a vitiline duct and also we've got this extension coming out which is going to be the developer in the urinary system which is the allantois which kind of comes out with it. Okay. Now in terms of the gut tube now which is all this orange area, all this orange tube, this orange tube. Where it starts is the oropharynx, which is the mouth. Where does it end? At the cloaca. Now, at this point in time, there's four parts of the gut tube. There's the pharyngeal, there's the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. The pharyngeal gut tube starts at the mouth and ends where the lung buds start. So at, at four weeks, we have the first diverticular, so the first thing that pops out of the gut tube, okay, pops out here, which is the lung buds, which you can see kind of like that. So that's where the pharyngeal gut ends, okay? All of this development I've done in a video, which is the pharyngeal arches. So I'm not gonna cover that today. But I'm gonna start the foregut here, which is the lung bud, diverticular and where the foregut ends is the diverticular of the liver which I'll cover a bit later. So from this point to this point is the foregut and so that's the start and finish. Starts at the liver bud, ends, sorry, starts at the lung bud, ends at the liver bud. That's the foregut. Now just quickly for completion, as the lung bud pops out it's going to be coming out of here and so it's going to be developing in this space okay and so because it pulls that this light lining with it the lining around the lung is going to be the visceral pleura okay coming all the way to this one which is the parietal pleura and it's going to fill all that space up with lung but because we've already done the respiratory I'm not going to bother with that anymore today so I'm going to go back so let's forget about that for the time being so from the liver bud diverticular all the way to about this point is the esophagus, about 25 centimetres in length. Now the first third kind of comes out its um, skeletal muscle, so it's going to be innervated by probably the fourth to the sixth pharyngeal arch, which is the vagus nerve, and the bottom two thirds is going to become innervated by the splanchnic plexus. So that's a kind of a difference in the way it develops. Now the esophagus is fairly short to begin with, but as the heart, which we can see in this space, and the lungs, which we showed there, develops, it lengthens the esophagus, which makes it obviously much longer. Now this becomes important for when we move into the stomach development. The final thing I'll just say with the uh, esophagus, which is around the clinical correlates, is as it separates the lungs and the, the esophagus separates, sometimes we can get problems, atresia they call it, where fistulas or certain um, changes in the way they've separated can occur and that may have the esophagus attached to the lungs higher up or lower down or they can be completely separated and that's obviously a problem for both um, breathing and digestion and may warrant surgery. Other things that could go wrong could be the, eso the esophagus gets blocked up, so we call that stenosis, and that can't allow things to go through. Or we can get hiatus hernias, so the way that the thoracic cavity gets sealed off by a structure that we call the septum transversum, which we'll cover in a second, which comes from the head and kind of goes around the heart and comes underneath the heart, which is going to be essentially the diaphragm. The way that that develops affects um, uh, can be congenitally problematic and that can cause a hiatus hernia which causes the stomach to go up into the lungs. So that's the esophagus. Moving down to the stomach. Now the stomach essentially starts as a tube like so, just like this piece of paper. Hollow tube that sits down like this, just like that. Now it's important to note that it is connected to the back wall, okay, so all the gut tube, actually I will draw it, is connected to the back wall by a mesentery. Now I'll cover this more extensively in the mesentery lecture, but essentially what it does is it has a free suspending 
So there's your gut tube, like so. And this dorsal mesentery goes around the gut tube, like so. So it's kind of a two leaflet invagination that sits around the suspending gut tube. Okay. Now, in the foregut only, there will be a ventral mesentery as well, okay, which becomes important for ligaments a bit later on, but I'll just remove that part off. So it's just important to note that at this point, all we've got is a dorsal mesentery, which wraps around the gut tube, which is going to be the visceral peritoneum. So that's going to be what we see here with the stomach. Okay, so the stomach is just a tube at this point with the back wall, like so, having the dorsal mesentery. So like that. Now, what's going to happen? Stomach will rotate in two planes. If you look down on the stomach like so, that's the longitudinal plane. So it's going to turn in this plane. And there's also going to be a plane that goes from the front to the back. So it's going to turn in that plane. Okay? So there's two planes, longitudinal, anterior, posterior. The first thing that the stomach will do is it will start to elongate out the back. So if you were to look at it like this, it would be kind of fusiform shaped, which is kind of pouchy at the back end. That's just due to more cells are more active at the back than the front. So it pops out like so. The next thing it will do, so I'll grab a real stomach now. The next thing it will do is if you're looking down on it, it will turn 90 degrees clockwise. So it turns like that. What that means is the right surface of the stomach goes to the back. The left surface goes to the front. The anterior surface goes to the right and the posterior surface goes to the left. This becomes important because that mesentery will start to become floppy. Okay. Out like this because it's going to be attached here like so and so that mesentery becomes floppy here like so but it's also important because at the start the vagus nerve will be supplying so the right vagus is going to be supplying the right surface the left vagus left surface but now because you turn it the names are going to change to the posterior and anterior vagus because of that 90 degrees turn so we've now turned it like so okay so we've gone now like this we continue to have unequal growth so all the cells here which is going to be the greater curvature go much more active than the inner part so we get the big bulging part like so and then what happens in the anterior posterior plane it turns like that which causes the stomach to sit more as we know it now we have the cardia at the top the greater curvature now sit in like this, lesser curvature in here, and we go into the pylorus sit in like so. So that's kind of how it is more orientated now. Now, it was once in the midline, but as it turns like this, it will move more to the right. Okay? And so that's important also to be aware of. This dorsal mesentery is going to come forward, flop over. Now, because it's all floppy now, because you've stretched it, it's going to double back on itself, fuse, and kind of flop over the top of this colon that goes across, which is a transverse column, and that gives you essentially the greater omentum. But I'll cover that in the fourth lecture, which is the mesentery. The ventral mesentery, which I said sits at the front like this, which is going to be in the lesser curvature coming off here, so that's the ventral mesentery, that's going to turn names, its name into the lesser omentum which I will explain now as we move into the remaining part of the gut tube. So what we're left with, so there's your stomach coming down like so. Okay, so this is going to be stomach. This is going to be the greater curvature like so, and this is going to be the lesser curvature, greater curvature like that. Now we're going to have, these are where, where all the diverticula occur. So I'll do this color in blue so this is what we call the dorsal pancreas okay if you've got a dorsal you need a ventral so there's your ventral pancreas coming off like that in green we're going to have a diverticular oh that's not green we're going to have a diverticular off here which is going to be another one okay and going up into into here is the liver 
So as we said earlier, this is going to be the septum transversum. Okay, this has come from C3 to 5. It's gone around the heart, come underneath and sat underneath the heart. So as it's moved around the heart, it's developed the fibrous pericardium of the heart, which is why from 3, 4, 5, we've got the phrenic nerve, and that's why the phrenic nerve supplies the fibrous pericardium. And then sitting on that is the diaphragm. The liver will grow up into the diaphragm, so this is at about the fourth week. So the liver will start to grow into it. All the epithelial or endodermal cells will essentially give you the hepatocytes. Now, blood vessels like the umbilical vein and the vitelline vein will grow into the liver, and that will give you the liver sinusoids. And all the mesoderm will also go into the liver, and that will give you things like Kufta cells, connective stroma, etc. So I'll get rid of the, the developing liver. What starts to happen though, as the liver develops, it really thins out this tube here, okay, which is essentially important for carrying bile. Now this tube will bifurcate, which is going to give you the, the right and the left, or the right and the left um, hepatic duct. Together they will join to give you the common hepatic duct. And coming off here is going to be the cystic duct. That will elongate to give you the gallbladder. Okay, so the gallbladder sits like so. And where the cystic duct comes in with a common hepatic duct, that's now going to give you the common bile duct going down like so. Coming off, a diverticular coming off down here is going to be the ventral pancreas. And coming off the back wall is the dorsal pancreas. But with the way that the liver, sorry, with the way that the stomach rotates, it's going to spin this around. So I'll slightly change the way that the stomach looks. And so because it comes up like so, it's made kind of like a C shape. Okay, like so, which goes into the stomach. And so this has to come around the back because the liver has rotated 90 degrees in the anterior posterior plane. So here we got coming behind. And so this is going to be the common bile duct now. Going in like this, coming around like this. And the, the ventral has to come around to the back. Okay, So the ventral pancreas will sit down like this. And the dorsal pancreas will elongate like so. Okay, so that's going to give you the pancreas as we know it. Now, where that separation point was, that's going to be the end of the foregut. So that's the end of the foregut, and that's the start of the midgut. So basically, the end point is where you had the liver diverticular coming off. As the common bile duct comes into the back here, so it's kind of gone around like that, it's going to merge with the common bile duct, common pancreatic duct, should I say, and that comes in like so. Okay. The ventral pancreas gives the unconnut process or the head of the pancreas and the dorsal gives the rest of the pancreas, like so. There will be a separation of a duct that will go straight into like so, and that's going to be the accessory duct, which is higher. So that goes into the minor duodenal papillae, and the major duodenal papillae is the combination of the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct, like so. Now, just to, for completion, the first part, so from the stomach to the first part of the, this is the first part of the duodenum, that is intraperitoneal, so it's sticking out. But because this goes to the back wall, basically all this section here up to here is going to be retroperitoneal. The spleen will sit out here like so, and that comes back in. So this is going to be intraperitoneal. 
and the last kind of third, fourth part of the duodenum, which goes into the jejunum, will come back to intraperitoneal. So it's only going to be this part here that's actually retroperitoneal. Finally, in terms of blood supply, as we've seen from the duet, sorry, the dorsal aorta coming down the back wall, the main branch going to the foregut is the cystic duct. The cystic duct will branch into three. It will give a left gastric, which is basically going to do bits of the esophagus and the lesser curvature. It's going to be the splenic, which is going to go and do a lot of the pancreas, spleen, bit of the bit of the um, greater curvature, the rest of short gastrics, the rest of the cardia. And then we're left with a hepatic proper, which is going to innovate these structures, okay, but also give a gastroduodenal branch, which is going to go down, supply the bottom part of the stomach and the pancreas, gastro and the duodenum. So this is where you have a point of mergence. So a small part in this area is going to have blood supply from the midgut, which is going to be superior mesenteric, and the um, one of the branches from the celiac, which is going to be the superior pancreaduodenal, going to merge from the inferior pancreaduodenal, and that's what's going to supply the bloodshed area there. So that's basically the foregut. So hopefully now you've got an idea of how the foregut and the structures that are developed. We've seen the foregut starts at the lung bud, ends at the point of the, the liver bud. It's blood supply. All those structures that come from between those two areas are supplied by the cyst, the, the, sorry, is supplied by the celiac artery, okay? Its main diverticular is going to be the liver, which is also going to have the ducts for the bile, including the gallbladder. In, also, we've got the two parts of the pancreas, being the ventral and the dorsal, and now you know what the ventral forms, being the unconut in the body, and the rest, or should I say the head, the rest being the body and the tail. The spleen kind of comes at the back in the dorsal, um, dorsal mesentery it forms in there. And you've also seen how the stomach develops and rotates. So hopefully that's helped you with the foregut. Now we're going to move on to the midgut.